Yeah. All right, welcome everybody. All right, so. Welcome, today, thank you. Yeah, today I want to. Beautiful uh, work. Thank you. I want to cover, um, go back to the Baroque and cover some, there's a whole documentary by that um, Polish English art critic we like. And, um, but also I'll show some paintings by Franz Hals, particularly uh, mm. Dutch painter who was co contemporary with uh, Rembrandt and uh, considered one of the great Northern Baroque painters. What's uh, the name? Uh, <clears throat> Franz Hals, you'll see. Yeah. But before I do, I wanted to uh, uh, <clears throat> So I think I should have done this early on. I want to, about what this course is about, okay? I mean, I probably should have done it early on and I didn't, just so there's no misunderstanding. Um, my, when I look at the, the Baba Zoom uh, schedule of daily schedule events, this is the only class that's not specifically about Mayor Baba. And um, I've had some thoughts recently, maybe I should take it off and, and there's a couple, of, uh, people like uh, uh, Marla has her art class. There's a link to it on Baba Zoom, but then it takes you somewhere off often. Of so I don't know. I, I just uh, thought, is it appropriate or not? But it, it's the only class that's not specific about my involvement on Baba Zoom. So that made me think I need to at least, at least get clear about what the what my purpose and um, assumptions are for the class. And so that there's no misunderstanding. So the, the purpose of this class is um, and why I wanted to do it was to expand awareness of the visual arts, to recognize great Western. Uh, can you all see this? Or do I, do I have it on? Um, do I have it on share no. screen? No. no. Well, I forgot to put it on share screen. All right. Sorry about that. Uh, share screen. Okay. Now, can you see it? Can you mm -hmm. see it? Yeah. Okay. Yes. yes. So, so, to expand awareness of the visual arts, to recognize great Western and world masters of painting, sculpture, and architecture, with also some reference to the artist's biographies that's relevant to their art. Okay, this expand our awareness of, of all the uh, numbers of uh, great artists. Uh, second one, to increase the participants' knowledge of the generally accepted artistic periods and their cultural historical influences in Western and world history, like the Renaissance, like the Baroque, uh, like the classical period, like the Song Dynasty, et cetera. So I mean, that there's move, there's periods, okay? So just to get a, increase our uh, knowledge of those periods and some of the, and not all, but, but the main artists in those periods and the style, what they were, what they were, what the unique style is for each of those, of those uh, uh, periods and why they were um, different from the one before, okay? Third, to sharpen and improve the work participants' ability to see, analyze, and discuss works of art using both subjective, meaning feelings, sensations, intuitions, gut reactions, et cetera, and objective criteria, meaning commenting on the artist's mastery of design, composition, use of color, originality, line, brush technique, non-traditional methods and techniques, subject matter content, draftsmanship, meaning drawing ability, et cetera, okay? So that, um, uh, that we learn from these uh, these documentaries, particularly the short one, like uh, the short ones, listening to how these art critics are approaching the paintings they're discovering and and getting a sense. So that that rubs off. So that um, you, you see how they're um, uh, analyzing and they're talking about uh, what the painting is doing and objectively. Okay, using referring to these so that to to sharpen and improve our ability to be able to do that. Okay. All right. all right, so then this is important. This is a secular class, all right? And, and, and this is where I wanna, because it's on Baba Zoom, which is all Baba, this is the one secular class. And I'm teaching it in the same way art appreciation courses are presented at an undergraduate level in most colleges or adult education classes, such as Ollie at Coastal Carolina University of Myrtle Beach, where I taught this. It's, so the course is not aligned with any spiritual, religious or philosophical movement or belief system. And even though it's on Baba Zoom and you may think that, or, or some people may think that it's, it's not, okay? It's just a secular class. And um, so, and we're kind of hitchhiking on Baba Zoom and I'm wondering whether I should continue doing that. I'm not, I'm not gonna change it yet, but this has been in the back of my mind. 
Okay, so um, to participate in the spirit of my art appreciation class, I hope to see participants be open to moving beyond judging in a positive or a negative way. An artist works based on one, the artist's character or behaviors. Like for instance, oh, I read a biography of, of uh, Picasso and he's such a jerk towards women and he was so hurtful. I don't like his paintings. <laughs> okay, that, in other words, taking his character and there are some real jerks who are artists but were great painters. And, and, and so, so to, to move away from that, you're entitled to do it. I can't stop you, but I'm saying the spirit of my art class is, is to move away from that, okay? Uh, you can still disapprove of Picasso's, um, <clears throat> the way he treated women and still love his paintings, I think. Or still pre appreciate his paintings for what he did. That's what I'm saying. Uh, but not to solely base your uh, evaluation or whether you uh, like his paintings, not because he was a jerk with uh, in relation to the woman in his life. B, uh, not to, uh, the, the artist, um, we're not judging the artist's um, um, work based on their spiritual, religious, political, or philosophical beliefs. Oh, this person was a communist, uh, therefore, blah, blah, blah. Or he was, um, I don't know, whatever, you know, an atheist. Therefore, I only like uh, art by uh, uh, people who believe in God, you know, that kind of thing. Um, three, the artist's psychological states or mental health. And I, no, that person was crazy. He was nuts. And obviously, the, the, um, the paintings are... I wonder where they really had value because he was psychotic or whatever, you know. Uh, lots of artists were, were had mental health issues like Van Gogh, for instance. All right, and obviously this is more uh, politically correct. The artists, I'm not judging them based on the artist's nationality, race, gender, or sexual orientation. Also, the last one's important, the content or subject matter of the works of art. Oh, it's too sexual uh, or it's too religious and I'm, not, I'm an atheist and, or whatever, you know. So we're looking at um, the content is, is part of it, but it's not the whole thing, okay? We're looking at how the artist is, uh, is using his materials and, and uh, using those, the basic elements of art, uh, painting, for instance, design, color, et cetera, et cetera, I mentioned before, as a way of evaluating that, not just on their content, or the content or the subject matter of the works of art. Okay, and finally, uh, the underli my underlying assumption is that all excellent art is spiritual because it flows from the artist's creative spirit, which mirrors the creativity of the divine. Uh, God is the pres creator, preserver, destroyer. So we're, our, all artists are participating because our consciousness is linked with the divine. But when you're being creative, we're, we're participating in divine creativity. So to me, all art that's, that's excellent is, is spiritual just for that reason. Um, a work of art has the ability to touch the soul of the viewer and therefore can be considered spiritual art. If it's rendered with both mastery of the fundamental elements of painting, sculpture, and architecture, and with an original voice, okay? So for me, a portrait by Rembrandt, a landscape by Cezanne or Van Gogh, Picasso's Guernica, for instance, are all equally as spiritual as Michelangelo's Pieta, where, you know, um, his mother's holding the pieces of feather just come down off the cross, okay? Um, so that's my basic premise. Everyone's entitled to their point of view, but I, I, I've intentionally put to participate in the spirit of my art class. Uh, that's that's what I uh, hope people will do. You you don't have to, but um, that's my that's my wish. All right, any comments about that? Yeah, I'm wondering who criticized you. Has somebody from the Baba community no, 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 criticized that? I just felt, no, I just felt that it, this, this needed to, no one criticized me. I just felt this needed to be said explicitly, okay? But was right. it prompted by any reaction, negative reaction in the Baba world? No, uh-uh. Oh, no. good. Okay. Right, yeah. and, and if we wanted to give you some feedback or um, embroidery, well, on your statements, I don't have your email. Oh yeah, uh, you can give. You want to give any feedback now? Oh no, I'm I'm thinking it through, but I mean, I I think there's so much room to grow in appreciating art and the various zeitgeists and how the avatars have worked through the ages and consciousness changing in humanity. Well, what do you mean by avatars? Oh, I, I well, be, because you're going back to earlier ages where Christ might have been the avatar. I don't know as you've, at least I haven't been to many classes where you've had Buddhist orientation. Yeah. But, but anyway, if I wanted to give feedback, you have yeah, okay. how to 
but that's, I... that's what I'm not what I'm not doing is relating the art to avatar specifically to, to the avatar because it's not a mayor baba art class oh i yeah i, I understand that but if some somebody was giving you a real critique and wanted to be that way i think there's all kinds of ways of uh, seeing it. you could say you want it to be that way but uh, but i want this to be open to everybody but so i'm not yeah gonna, absolutely and i'm not going to do that <laughs> but can, i don't want you not to do it <laughs> wow well, okay well just, joe yes. isn't isn't the appreciation of art uh, you know, uh, uh, with the spirit of Baba and, and his teachings? Uh, yeah. The, the, saying, appreciation, oh, yeah. The appreciation of art and beauty. And, oh, and uh, the spiritual. Mayor Baba once says he loved artists. Um, yeah. For various reasons. So that's, a, it's assumed. It's the underlying assumption here. Okay. But, but, um, but, uh, but given that, I'm saying that all, I think all excellent <laughs> art is spiritual. All right. So, of course. Right. Yeah. Well, right. But that's, yeah. but I think that's it. Con, it's consecutive. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> what? I, I just think that the, that the appreciation of art and the study of art and the meaning of art and the, is, is, is uh, aligned with the teachings that Baba uh, professed. And of that's course. why this is yeah. an appropriate course for. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, I, I think great art can touch the soul, which makes it spiritual. Okay, right, it's, not, right. it's not the content. For me, it's not the content. It, it's a, a work of art can be done in a way that whether it's a you could paint a uh, like it's a, a, a Anselm. Um, what's his name? We looked at last week. Because look at look at those paintings. They're they're like uh, uh, this. The aspect of uh, destruction and, and chaos and the world falling apart and grays and browns. It's not obviously spiritual. What's made it spiritual because it's because that's part of that's part of uh, and, and he does it with so much mastery and it's also part of the nature of life that it that it, it falls apart and crumbles, you know. So um, so or or a, a road just painting a picture of, of a of a rose is spiritual. It's done like uh, Georgia O'Keeffe or the way she did flowers. So, uh, uh, so but I, I guess I just wanted to distinguish that spiritual art isn't necessarily overtly spiritual, like paintings of the avatar or paintings of um, Jesus or, or intentionally, you know, like anything is potentially, this is any, everything has, uh, and Van Gogh, I think really, his, his landscapes are, um, emerge or alive with spirituality. There's a divine, there's an energy in them that's uh, otherworldly. So, uh, anyway, my email, let me just type it in, okay? And uh, you can, here it is. And you can say whatever you want to say. Hey, what about this about, Joe? What? Elizabeth, I just got here. What brought this about, this um, I, I was just going to get some, I don't know, it just, discussions i just wanted to give uh can everybody see my email here i i realized i never did this i just wanted to get clear that what my uh, for my uh, under, uh no it's all good yeah, at gmail.com super and if you want a copy of this email me and i'll send you a copy all right oh okay great all right so let's move on um <clears throat> What I want to do here. So I want to start with uh, the uh, Franz Hals, who was a Dutch painter. He was contemporary of uh, Rembrandt. And then we'll look at a few little short videos of him. I lived from 1582 to 1666 of the early Baroque period. Um, and 
So Rembrandt was living around the same time. Yeah. Uh, he, he lived and worked in Harlem. I guess that's where New York City Harlem was got the name from Harlem and, uh, and Holland. Um, he's best known for his portraits, mainly of wealthy citizens. And, and he also he did individual portraits, large group portraits for local civic guards like Rembrandt did. And um, uh, Hollis was fond of daylight, silvery sheen, while Rembrandt used golden glow effects based upon artificial contrast of low light and gloom. Uh, Hals, Hals is known for his freedom of his brushstroke, you'll see. And it's really way ahead of his time. Uh, he, he sees the moment in life of his subject with rare intuitions. And he could just get it right off, you know, his, his paintings had capture the life of the, or uh, an expression of, uh, with spontaneity. That's probably pretty amazing. Um, what he, what, uh, see what nature displayed in that moment, he reproduced thoroughly in a delicate scale of color with mastery over every form of expression. He became so clever that exact tone, light and shade and modeling were obtained with a few marked and fluid strokes of the brush. Okay. Uh, let's see, we'll look at a few of them here. What, what years are these, Joe? Um, he lived from, he lived from uh, 1582 to 1666 in Holland. But that would be the same time as Caraggio, right? More um, or less. Down in Italy, yeah, yeah, Caravaggio, and, yeah, that's right. And um, Artemisia. All oh, those um, people. Yeah, they were in Italy, but he's, these are up. This is the northern group. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah. The costume and detailing is just impeccable. Yeah. And he had a way of capturing the individuality of the person, the unique personality that would come through. But his draw his his drawing skills are amazing. Um, but he was very popular and, and sought after as a portrait artist from on the wealthy class. You know that they were um, the, um, Antwerp was the center of world trading for a while there, and these very uh, wealthy merchant class. They everybody want their portrait done. And it really captures their humanity, I think. And um, it doesn't gloss them over. Yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> wow, he only lived five years. What was that last one? He only lived five years. What? The, the gesture. What, what did it say about? Which the, one? The, the gesture with the loot. Couple of couple of yes, that one, yeah. What does that mean? Sixteen twenty to sixteen. Uh, no, no, it means he painted it sometime in there. They're not sure the exact. Oh, it didn't take. Yeah, wow. Not sure the exact thing. <laughs> this looks like a real character in here. And these people look so modern too. You know, just put them in modern clothes. Uh, trim their beards a little bit, maybe. The His style is much like Rembrandt, but not yeah. quite as dark. Exactly, that's what they're saying. Yeah, he's using lighter backgrounds. You know, it's not using such sharp. And this is you can see this is much softer, and it's almost um, French in a way. The painting. Uh, all right, so that's I got a couple of uh, interesting videos um, about Franz Hollands. Well, men's clothes was more interesting. Yeah. Yeah, decidedly.
It's as if he's saying, no, no, no more. I don't want to play yet another song. (laughs) (laughs) You imagine that he's been singing and playing the flute so beautifully that his audience is asking for more. Well, look at the pleasure on his face. He looks so self-satisfied. He's just turned away. His hand is up. (laughs) The other hand is still on the flute as if he's just stopped with his finger in one of its holes. I can't possibly play another. (laughs) (laughs) Or he could just be pausing and singing which is a standard type that we see in 17th century Dutch painting. The thing, of course, that carries this painting is its brushwork, its sense of informality, its sense of the momentary, the way in which the fluidity of the artist's hand moving through this canvas and the motion of the figure himself are so beautifully brought together. I thought you were going to say what carries this painting is the feather. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Because it's so wild, this giant white feather that completes this circular form that starts down by his mouth. There's all that space above so that his face is even slightly lower than center, but also the sense that this space to move in, that the artist has only captured this one frame, and that there's plenty of other things that are going around outside of what we can see. You don't normally think about Hals as a colorist, but the colors are fabulous in this painting, these mauve purples and the blue of his sleeve that just comes out a little bit around his wrist and touches of blue in the green on his left shoulder and then touches of bluish white around his wrist. All of which tends to highlight the ruddy warm color of the flute itself and of course of his cheeks. It is just a wonderfully playful moment, so expertly caught, and yet the artist makes the image look so easy to create. His face turns away and yet we really feel very engaged with this figure. An incredible sense of bravura and immediacy, and those are the things that Hulse is known for. I just thought, did I get my email as DeSabatino Joe at Gmail? I didn't say Joe DeSabatino, it's DeSabatino Joe at Gmail. I just want to make sure I get it correctly. Is that a new email, Joe? No, it's one I've had for years. Okay, all right. DeSabatino Joe at Gmail.com. Yeah, so uh, uh, that's interesting what they were saying, how the the painting suggests that there's action going on around. You booked a sunny Verbo ski chalet with end- Okay, there's like what's going on around the, the, the musician and he's, he's gesturing to them. So you can, uh, there's a lot of space and you can just fill that in. So that's this, this um, part of the mask, um, the art is to suggest action without actually showing it or you just show it through one character uh, and um, imply also they were commenting on the uh, the circular motion starting with his lips and moving around so these are always all, all the in the color they were um, commenting on the color of the mob etc cetera, etc cetera. always to um, with objectively evaluate and paint Frans Hals is een van de meest virtuose schilders uit die hele gouden eeuw. Er was bijna geen schilder die zo grof en raak kon schilderen. Uh, Vrijwel zonder correctie uh, kon hij iemands uitdrukking vangen. Schilderijen van Hals laten niemand onberoerd. Je je wordt er altijd door uitgedaagd. En dat is niet alleen in de karakters die hij weergeeft en die je echt gewoon kunt lezen, maar ook in de, in de manier waarop het geschilderd is. Heel snel, heel vlot, met hele korte toetsen, trefzeker, heel los. En dat is natuurlijk geniaal dat je dat kunt. Juist door die hele grove, losse schilderstijl van Hals lukt het hem om de suggestie te wekken dat je mensen op een plotseling uh, moment ziet. Doordat hij precies die dingen die het belangrijkst waren benadrukt, maar de details weglaat, geeft hij de kijker als het ware de ruimte om de rest zelf in te vullen. En daardoor uh, lijkt een figuur des te meer tot leven te komen. Uh, I think I captured this momentary uh, expression, this smile. 
Um, it's not easy before the age of uh, cameras, you know, it's just a, it's a split second expression and it's gone. And so he had to do it from memory. What about that white underline? What? The Say white what? underlining of the lower lip. It's so oh. stark. I see. It's in the previous couple of frames. Like the figure decimated. Oh. Into full and this this part, right? It's not, it's not actually white. Um, it's a, it's actually part of the skin tone. It works. There's a highlight on it. The light the light is coming from here. I always have a where in the painting is the light coming from, and that's hitting the high making highlights and then shadows. So it's uh, the light's coming from upper left down, and so it's hitting here. And you see, it's got this is this is the most uh, has done. Um, whitest and brightest highlight. Uh, and, daardoor, and then uh, it, figuur uh, it makes sense that this part is slightly in shadow from his smile. So it's not quite as bright as this, but it's still in the same, same color, just not as much white in it. <clears throat> so that gives a sense of, of uh, reality, sense of, <clears throat> and also here is the highlight. Well, this is higher. This is closer to you. So it's gonna have a highlight here, but all along here and then here, a little bit on the teeth, a little bit of light. But the light just, so always ask yourself if it's a conventional portrait or, or scene, uh, in, particularly an indoor scene, where's the light coming from? And the artist will have to do that to make it consistent. Um, it, now he could be setting up an artificial light, a lamp or whatever, or it could be sunlight coming in the window. <laughs> but it's even true outdoors too, you know, so. Yeah. So to me, it's so uh, different, so uh, such a stark difference, I guess, against the red, that it. I wondered if he it was clownish, because it goes almost around his whole mouth. It goes around three quarters of his mouth. Yeah, okay. I think um, do, do, you don't think it works. I personally don't like it. I, I don't oh, like okay. that very very bright white under his lip. But you know, I'm not an artist, so I don't What's know. It doesn't matter. Um, that's not that you don't have to be an artist to be able to make a critique. Um, I think you got to stand back. I bet if you stand back, and this is a close up, that it, that it would work. But it also um, it's a frame in a way for his mouth. He's got this he's got this uh, uh, friendly, joking kind of smile. Um, so I don't know. I'd have to see it. Uh, yeah, it's better 10 feet years. back. You're right. Yeah, well, I'm not sure how big it is. Er werd in de 17e eeuw al veel over geschreven. Een uh, kunstkenner, een leerling van Rembrandt, omschrijft het als het herkennen van een vriend in schemerlicht of in de verte. Zolang je een paar goede aanknopingspunten hebt, vult je oog de rest als vanzelf aan. En dan lijkt het des te echter. Ik ben back up on that one. Of aan. En waar is de light coming from? Where do you think the light's coming from in this painting? From the top right? Yeah, it's coming from this, it's falling here, 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 it's coming down. Well, I would say top left. No, this is, this actually is kind of contradiction here because um, <clears throat> this is all fairly strongly lit and yet he's got shadows here. And the, the light, the strong light's gotta be coming down this way, hitting his forehead, his nose, a little bit of the lip this way. And then, that and that would make sense if you don't look at the if you don't look at the right hand's light it would make sense these shadows. But um, this this uh, light could in a way it would make sense if it's way in the background and it's not affecting his face. But if it's up close, it, it actually doesn't it doesn't make sense. It should be reversed. This darker color should be over here, and this lighter color maybe up here. But so maybe two sources of light. Right. Sources. Well, that's possible. Yeah, but if there is yeah. light over here, then it would lighten this side of the face. Uh, so it can't be too close, or else this, or you wouldn't have these dark shadows there. So uh, that's so how about how about from the center left? Center I mean, left. towards us, towards us, and to the left, and coming that way, and then it would light up the background that way, or to the right it would light up the right background if it was coming from the left center here no no towards you 
towards us, but to the left. Here? Yeah, but coming from now, now out towards his nose a little bit and then coming that way. So like this? Yeah, yeah, uh, from... Oh, not, I see. From this not, angle. From, not, not from the plane, not from the to the left, not from the left hand plane, but to uh, I don't know, uh, like uh, 45 degree angle from the left with the top. Yeah, yeah, 45 part degree part angle the, from the left. So yeah. this is the left side, you mean, right? Right. Yeah. Well, so about right, about about there. Um, yeah. Yeah. But out 45 degrees now. Look. It's hit so, or 30 degrees out 30 degrees from that plane, which is about there. Yeah, yeah. Well, the light is it, let's see, is it coming, coming from this? it would come from the top left? It, it wouldn't no, be down no, it, then it, if it came from the top left, it wouldn't hit the background on the right. Uh, you know, you're right, it could be coming from here. I, I assume it's there, it could be coming from here, and that would make sense. And then creating the shadow. Um, his eyelids, he knows his eyelids. The cap doesn't. His lips does have a something, you know. So there's a play of light and shadow there. But it's just that um, the degree this this whole side brightly lit doesn't come doesn't make sense to have uh, it would look, it would lighten up the, where the shadow is. So that's what I'm saying. It doesn't it doesn't quite work unless this light is way in the background somewhere. Maybe right um, down. Going Pardon? up. Say that again. They said there may be two sources of light. Uh, yeah. Uh, oh, the light is coming. The light is coming from in front of him to the left. Yeah. So there it's coming. Be, to, there has to be, coming to create this shadow. There has to be uh, light on the opposite side of the face. Right. So and then it goes right through. Right if it's coming in front of him, it will light up the back yeah. right. But it, but but all I'm but I'm saying it's just interesting. This layer over here, you would think he would make it darker, to, um, like no. this, like yeah, because because if if this is light over here, isn't it gonna? If it's close, it's gonna um, lighten up where the shadow is. It, it's coming in front of him on his left on his on the left side of the picture, right? And, but in front of him, not not directly. Okay. In front of him coming right at his nose at about a 30 degree angle. I got that. The other thing you can look at is the, <laughs> the white of his eye on his um, left eye is very white. And also you can see the shadow of his shoulders over to the right. Yeah. So um, uh, Don, do you think this, this works then even with this light background here with the direction of the light, it still works having this light background? Yeah, I think I think I th I could see the light coming, kind of at an angle of his nose, right? From okay, the, left, side, from the left side of the picture, no, and I then coming that. back, coming and shading the right side of his face, but going on past him and hitting the wall. Oh, I see what you're saying. Coming behind him. Okay. Wait a minute. Uh huh. So the light's coming this way, and it's going right across and lighting up the wall. Okay. That's interesting. Maybe, maybe that's what's happening. Okay. Uh, yeah. All right. That's a good observation. So okay. what? What is? What is his dress? His what he's wearing? I mean, is it? Does that say anything to you? Um, I'm not sure. From that time, I don't know. Like a court jester would yeah, look I can't tell this way. Yeah, he's definitely not an aristocrat, so it could be a court jester. Yeah. Okay. All right, that's good. That's interesting. Okay. Vult je oog de rest als vanzelf aan en dan lijkt het des te echter. De beroemde uh, Engels-Amerikaanse uh, schilder Whistler, die was in 1902 was die in Haarlem. En uh, hij ging daar ook dit schilderij, de regentessen van het oude mannenhuis, bekijken. En raakte zo in vervoering dat hij de gezichten van de, van de regentessen ging, ging aaien en beroeren. Onderwijl roepend, oh ik wil ze aanraken, oh ik wil ze aanraken. Het nou, is natuurlijk ongelooflijk dat je dat als schilder, dat je dat uh, bij een andere schilder teweeg kunt brengen. Dat hij zo ongelooflijk meegesleept wordt in zijn enthousiasme.
doorgaans bouwt Hals zijn schilderijen in verschillende lagen op. Hij begint vaak met een uh, grove g- schets, vaak in een grijzige contourlijn aangegeven. En van daaruit werkte hij in lagen. Wat heel bijzonder is en wat we echt pas sinds een jaar weten, is dat hij in sommige gevallen ook à la prima schilderde. Dus in één keer. Dat is bijvoorbeeld het geval bij het portret van Jasper Schade. En die hele snelle manier van werken heeft er alles mee te maken dat hij zo'n vluchtige uitdrukking kon vangen. Want dat was natuurlijk ook iets wat, ja, wat niet lang precies zo in een gezicht te zien was. À la prima schilderen gold als een grote uitdaging in Italië en met name... Uh, Tintoretto stond erom bekend dat hij razendsnel alle prima schilderde en dingen direct voltooide. Het is heel spannend om uit te vinden dat nou ja, met name zo'n uitgewerkt portret als Jasper Schade, dat dat echt in één keer gedaan is. What language are they speaking, Joe? Sounds like Dutch to me. Dutch, that's what I thought it might be. Yeah, I think that's the Dutch museum area. So he's, uh, Hals is certainly considered one of the uh, great painters of the Northern. This is terrible. I've never heard of him before today. Uh, really? Wow. Yeah, it's, re- sure. it's really nice to see him, but I've not been too interested in the darker paintings. Right. Frans Hals Mali Baba is not an easy image to look at. Art historians have actually found documentation that this was a historical figure, somebody who actually lived in Harlem at this time. She was in fact committed to the city of Harlem's insane asylum. The owl comes from a Dutch expression, to be as drunk as an owl, but also a reference to the idea of night, and perhaps also a reference to Molly Baba's nickname, which referred to her as a witch, and of course the owl, a signifier of witchcraft. It's interesting to know, just biographically, that the artist Frans Hals saw was also committed there with her. So it seems that the artist was perhaps inspired to explore madness in this very direct way. This is a very complicated picture in terms of the response that it evokes in us. It's that feeling of seeing someone who isn't connected to reality anymore and wondering what their interaction is going to be with us. Is she going to ask something of me? Is she going to speak to me? I want to back away. So it's the unpredictability. It's the risk that she'll too easily step outside of the conventions of interaction. And that I won't know how to respond to her, and that's very uncomfortable. So here we have an artist who's painting this image of her. Maybe she sat for him, maybe she didn't. But it's an investigation of her insanity, it's an investigation of the dangers of drink. It's his own exploration of the world that his son inhabits, perhaps. But it doesn't seem particularly sympathetic. I think he painted her very honestly. I think that's part of the rapidity of the brushwork, is that it is a caught moment. She appears out of control, and part of the reason for that is Hall's handling of brushwork. You see this incredibly rapid, incredibly gestural brushwork. It seems almost as if it is his signature across the surface. Look, for instance, at the white at the bottom right that seems to be where she ties her apron, or look at the black line that defines the shadow at the end of the ruffle of her collar. It is just electric. We see his hand moving with lightning speed across that surface, and it seems to miss make the unease of this woman herself. I think the brushwork is a perfect metaphor for her state of mind in a way that is really tragic. And we have this moment of laughter, yet what we're looking at is the tragedy of mental illness. And I think that's part of what makes us uncomfortable as viewers. Especially since laughter should take place in a social environment, and we don't know where she is. But generally we would hope that she would be in a tavern with others, perhaps a joke had been told and she was responding. But because that other information is not available to us, she's isolated with her own laughter, making this even more uncomfortable. 
You know, the 17th century in Holland was this moment when painting becomes modern in that it begins to fulfill its potential to represent humanity in all of its facets. No longer is painting relegated to the religious, no longer is painting relegated to the royal portrait, but there is this attention now to some of the complications that make us human. I love the brushwork. Do you think, do you think she sat for that? Uh, who knows? Probably uh, he may have been watching her and wherever she was drinking and just went back and um, I don't think she sat. No, I think he was watching her. And he had the ability to, to recreate from memory uh, a momentary expression. Um, and you couldn't sit with your mouth like that. <laughs> you couldn't do it. Uh, you know, so that's what's remarkable about him. You know, most portraits, the person has their mouth closed. And, but he would capture these, uh, these, these smiles or uh, open mouth um, <clears throat> expressions that are just, you know, they last a microsecond. And then he could, he could do it. I'm, I'm amazed at how loose the brushwork is. It is so modern. I mean, I want to, um, and I'm surprised they accepted him because um, like the impressionists got so much criticism for their loose brushwork. And then, oh, this is just uh, amateur. So it's not finished. You know, this is an insult. And yet, look, he's doing, he's just, um, he's not blending the painting in. He's just layering these strokes of white. Uh, the owl, the owl yeah. looks a little afraid of her. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah the owl looks equally disturbed in way. <laughs> it's burying her, um, maybe mental illness, but uh, uh, it could be like a the bird is often a symbol for the soul, you know. But that bird, the owl, is painted very loosely. I mean, he didn't spend any time defining the feathers or anything. Just generally, you know. So that in itself is, like I said, very. Um, way ahead of a time uh, um, to be able to do that, to dare to do that. Uh, yeah. There's a last one. It's just a, I want to show, I want to show if you're gonna answer that phone, turn on mute your mic. Maybe, um, yeah. Okay. Let's see, is it, I think this is a 15 minutes. I'm not gonna show it all of his paintings to just put the music. So, could the <laughs> owl be an interpretation of something that's not really there? And that's why he did it very quickly. It's a, a symbol of what's going on, but not really there. Oh, yeah, that's right. Maybe the owl was not even there. He just put it in. Yeah. Yeah. To suggest yeah. Witchcraft, owls, witchcraft or... Exactly you know, what yeah. what it symbolized at that yeah. time. Right. Yeah. yeah. So he didn't spend much time on it because it was just a little bit of a figure. Right. Could have been. Uh, and also, also, if you don't define something too much, then um, it doesn't grab your eye so much. He wanted to mm -hmm. hit the eye to go focus on her face, I guess, and her gesture, and not so much on the owl. So you don't, mm -hmm. you know, bring it up to too much detail. Oh, I thought this was different. Let me see what this means. What about the, the comment about laughter, laughing at yourself? I think that's wonderful if you can laugh alone. You know, I mean, I thought it was. Uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, I thought it was. Well, that's. Uh, no. oh, wait a minute. Oh, I mean, you know. I see what I did. I made a mistake. I got two of the same. Okay, well. Um, okay, we got 244. I want to show this. So let's just move on to uh, another artist of that time. And this, uh, a woman. I just want to feature a woman artist from that time, Judith Lester. She was. Uh, <clears throat> oh, what happened there? I had it. Here's the only one. Let's, Judith Leister, L E Y S T E R. Judith A E D I T E R. There you go. Ah, got it. Okay. Uh, 1609 to 1660. 
Uh, she was another Dutch golden age painter, and not too many people know about her. Yeah, she was a highly skilled artist. She painted genre works, portraits, still life. Uh, although her work was highly regarded by her contemporaries, Leicester and her work became almost forgotten after her death. Her entire work oeuvre was attributed to Franz Howells or to her husband, uh, Jean Moulin's Molinaire. Until 1893, it wasn't until the late 19th century that she was recognized for her artistic ability. And that's the fate of a uh, woman artist oftentimes, right? Uh, she was born in Harlem, and again, a contemporary of Rembrandt and Franz Halls. They knew each other, um, Halls and her, they know that. There's not a lot known about her, but they knew that she was um, <clears throat> on some kind of professional terms with uh, Franz Halls, maybe influenced by him. Uh, <clears throat> let's see. She specialized in portrait-like genre scenes, typically one to three figures who generally exude good cheer and are shown against a plain background. Many are children, other are men drinking. Uh, she was particularly innovative in her domestic genre scenes. These are quite quiet scenes of women at home, often with candle or lamp lamplight, particularly from a woman's point of view. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Let's see, much of her other work, especially in Music Makers, was similar to that of her contemporaries, um, such as her brothers Franz, et cetera, et cetera. John Steen, he's not. Okay. All right, so let's just look at some of hers. Here's some of the ones on. <clears throat> Very dark. She's. Like Hall's, uh, Franz Hall's, she's got a, a darker background, but there's uh, reds really pop out as a result. And actually, there's some red blended into the background. <clears throat> what about the names of like a youth with a jug? You know, it yeah. looks like a youth with a jug, but who names them? Does the artist name them back uh, then? Good question. I'm, I'm not sure whether she named it or not. But oftentimes, it's just given a name. By someone else later. Yeah. 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 It's not necessarily hers. <clears throat> that's very unusual for the time period. Yeah, that's um, Caravaggio. I'm thinking because Caravaggio had those these uh, sharp contrasts between the chiaroscuro of uh, light and dark. You know. Uh, <clears throat> She's using that obscura, what's the name of the technique? Chiascuro, dark and light, contrast, yeah, right. Yeah, chiaro obscuro, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. But it's, you know, it's not in this painting, you know, but it's uh, it, that strong contrast <laughs> of, this makes the color pop out of the word, the ones that are in there. But this is more of a um, unified tone throughout. And actually, I like this better. <clears throat> Just uh, muted colors, grays and browns and subdued red. It's actually quite beautiful. <laughs> That's a good, playful scene. So you see, trying to express an interest in her and she's being uh, the mirror. <clears throat> is she interested or is she not interested in his advances? <clears throat> Maybe he's her boss. <laughs> and it's got this kind of <laughs> The civious smile on his face. I'm not sure. He may be your boss, but he might still be hitting. Yeah. On. He can still be yeah. hitting on him, if though he's yeah. your boss. <laughs> yeah. So you see, she was highly skilled. Uh, and and hardly anyone, and that's a shame. All those centuries, they, they didn't even know she existed. I got a few little <clears throat> documentaries on her. 
but she was popular and had commissions uh, while she was living. She never tried to use it in a man's name. Apparently not. We're in the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C., and we're looking at a Baroque painting by Judith Leister. This is a self-portrait. We use the word Baroque, which is interesting because she is in the Baroque period, but when we think about Baroque, we might think about Bernini or Caravaggio or the Italian Baroque and that sense of drama and energy. And here we are looking at a self-portrait. So what makes this Baroque? It's not a religious painting. Right, it's not the elevation of the cross or the ecstasy of St. Teresa. This is the northern Baroque. This is the Dutch Baroque. And at this point in the 17th century, the Netherlands had broken away from Spanish control and had established an independent republic. And in this republic, it was the merchant class that was buying art. And it was a really good time to be an artist. Especially if you could get into the guild. And Judith Leister did get into the guild. By guild, what I mean is something that's close to the 21st century notion of a, a trade union. And so this was the Guild of St. Luke. If you weren't in the guild, you really couldn't establish a proper studio with students, commissions would be much diminished. And Leister was a professional artist, and obviously she's a woman, and that combination was rare. We should say, too, that this is Holland, where Protestantism is the main religion, and so artists are not being commissioned by the church. So the big difference here is that we don't have the heavy-handed subject matter of religion. Instead, this is an artist at work who's just turned to talk to us for a moment. And there is that real sense of spontaneity. And you get that not only by this awkward momentary position of her body. For instance, her elbow is resting on the point of the chair. It can't be comfortable. You know she's not going to hold that for more than just a second. Her brush is poised. She's turned around. She's been interrupted. And there's also that Baroque sense sense of closeness. There's not a lot of space between her and us. That elbow is foreshortened coming into our space. The brushes on the lower right are foreshortened. There's that breaking of the barrier between the viewer's space and the space of the painting that we see often in Baroque art. Those brushes seem as if they're coming a little too close to us. She draws our eye up the angle of those brushes, past that wonderful flat plane of the palette, and I love this, with a representation of raw paint paint on the palette that she carefully painted. Right. It's particularly close to the portraits of Franz Hals. She and Franz Hals were contemporaries. Art historians have conjectured that she may have studied with Franz Hals or been his apprentice, but there's really no documentation to show that. But look at how loosely painted that rag is, or the lace on her sleeve, or especially that pink satin or silk of her skirt. Now, she probably wouldn't have worn this clothing when she painted, so she's showing herself dressed up, probably to show her importance, her position, the higher position of art itself. This is so self-consciously entangled. She's here painted a canvas that is a painting of a canvas and a rendering of a figure that was a very typical type in the 17th century called the Mary Company. If we look under the surface of paint, we can see that she had originally rendered a different figure, a female figure, perhaps a self-portrait. So this would be a self-portrait of her painting, a self-portrait. But instead, she decided to depict a type of subject that she was known for as a painter, the image of a musician or a singer or Mary Company pictures, she could sell herself as both a portrait painter and a genre painter to this new art buying public in Holland in the 17th century. And also possibly to the guild. There is conjecture that this was a presentation piece. She would have presented it as she came into the guild just a few years later. She displays a remarkable self-confidence and ease considering she's only 21 years old. Her work was lost us until late 19th and early 20th century, and many of her works were ascribed to Franz Hals. It's tempting to look at this through the lens of feminism, through the lens of women's oppression. We certainly don't talk about the work of male artists as the work of men. So the question then is, how do we look at a painting like this, acknowledging its separate history as the work of a woman, and yet also take the painting on its own merits, her skill on its own merits? Comments on that? Uh -huh. Let's see. About 59 minutes. That's got another one. Uh, let me see what this one is. 
But very few people know about her. I really like that last one. What was the name of it? The woman? Wow. Uh, good question. Home? <laughs> think so. Um, self portrait. Yeah, it's just the same one. Oh, wait a minute. I just did that. Uh, hmm. What was this one? Ah, I'm going around in circles here. So that's that one. So I want this one. Man Offering Money to a Woman by Dutch artist Judith Lister is a small oil painting with a big moral message. This message is conveyed not through mythical or religious heroes, but by two ordinary people. The everyday nature of the event is typical of Dutch art in the 17th century. This was a golden age, burnished by the talents of painters like Rembrandt, Franz Hals and Judith Lister. In Italy at this time, Artists were still producing religious and mythological scenes for ecclesiastical and upper-class patrons. Dutch artists, on the other hand, catered to the tastes of a middle-class public. They loved local landscapes, still lives, and scenes of ordinary people at work and play. Leicester was born in 1609 in Haarlem and belonged to Haarlem's Guild of St. Luke, a prestigious association of painters. She was best known for her scenes of ordinary life, including images of children and musicians. In a self-portrait made around 1633, she depicts herself at her easel. She's been working on a painting of a happy-faced fiddler. She turns energetically to face the viewer, mouth slightly open, to speak to us. This type of speaking portrait is new. Leicester painted Man Offering Money to a Woman in 1631 when she was in her twenties. The title is a modern invention. This painting has also been called The Proposition. Two figures inhabit a darkened interior. A young woman sits on a chair almost in the centre of the composition. She is modestly attired in a simple cape-like white top and greyish blue skirt. Her hair is pulled back into a small cap. With head bowed and eyes lowered, she concentrates on her sewing. The fingers of her right hand pull a needle through a piece of fabric held in her left hand. Parts of her face and body are lit by an oil lamp on the table to the left. It is the only source of light in this room, apart from the glowing coals in the foot warmer at her feet. A bearded man stands behind the table. Wearing a fur cap, he is dressed as though he has just come in from the outdoors. He is interrupting the woman's work. He looks at her face and places her hand on her upper arm, presumably to get her attention. Several gold coins can be seen in his other hand. He seems to be offering the money to the woman who is ignoring him. So Leicester tells her story through facial expressions and gestures. While the man looks at, touches, and offers money to the woman, her eyes and hands stay focused on her needlework. It has been suggested the man is presenting the cash as a prelude to courtship. That is, a wealthy suitor is asking a poor seamstress for her hand in marriage. 
It seems more likely, however, that he is offering the money in exchange for sex. The handful of coins probably represents much more money than the woman would earn if she spent the whole night sewing or embroidering. There is no doubt the man and his gesture are unwelcome. The woman's virtue lies in her rejecting his offer, whether it's a one-night stand or marriage for money. The interpretation of Leicester's concise narrative depends not only on our observation of the figure's glances and gestures, but also on what the viewer is expected to know. For example, the virtue of Leicester's heroine is certain. A woman depicted sewing or spinning in a domestic interior has been, since the 6th century BC, instantly recognisable as a good, hard-working and modest woman. Leicester's contemporaries continue to associate good women with needlework. A poem, written in 1629 by Gilles Jacobs Quintin of Harlem, declares that chastity and handiwork go hand in hand. Addressing mothers, he advises, Keep your daughter with you at home. Set her to sewing and spinning and lacework too, instead of courting. This brings us to the seamstress's foot warmer. Contemporary sayings praise the foot warmer for the comfort it provides and encourage suitors to imitate it in terms of warmth and pleasantness. The man in Leicester's painting uses money rather than warmth to tempt the woman, and so she chooses the companionship of the heater. Leicester did paint less reputable women as lessons for contemporary women on how not to behave. Her carousing couple, for instance, dates to about 1630. Two details suggest the woman's virtue is in question. Her companion is a musician and she holds a jug and a glass of wine. Parents were told not to let their daughters get romantically involved with musicians. And Quintin, the poet from Harlem, said that wine is what a disreputable woman craves. So the absence of wine and the presence of sewing paint a picture of a virtuous woman. The theme of a man propositioning a woman is fairly common in 17th century Dutch art. Usually, the woman accepts the proposition. A contemporary painting by Hendrik Pot, sometimes called the Enticement, shows a woman with two men. She accepts the advances of the man next to her. He brings his arm around the back of her neck to offer her a small flower. His other hand holds a glass of wine. She smiles at him while raising her left hand to touch his face and lifting her left leg in a suggestive manner. She wears a red skirt, jewels and feathers adorn her hair, and she sports a lace collar over a fur stole. The clothing and demeanour of the woman in Leicester's painting are more modest and less sexually inviting, and Leicester's woman is more compactly rendered. Her hands are placed across her body so that she appears closed to the viewer. Pot's woman holds her arms away from her body, so she comes across as open and accessible to the viewer. While Leicester's heroine sews, the woman in Pot's painting holds what looks like a musical instrument. Musical accomplishments were considered appropriate for refined young ladies, but music often accompanied carousing on a lower social level. Leicester died in 1660 at age 50. Because her paintings carried moral messages, she was admired by her contemporaries. But history did not serve her well. Most of her work was attributed to male painters like Franz Hals and her husband Jan Molinaire. Man offering money to a woman ended up as a painting by an anonymous artist. So there's this, uh, I think in all of the art of that period, and particularly Dutch art, there's this moral um, quality to it. They're, they're making commentary about the virtue or lack of virtue of, of subjects. 
Joe, considering that this was attributed to men, it would be interesting to see what the people at those days said about the paintings. Hmm. Even though she was a member of a guild, she wasn't getting credit for the paintings. So we are looking at them after they are known to be a woman's paintings. Well, she got credit at the time. But she then was, it went away after she after died? She died. Her, it just, she just vanished. But while she was alive, uh, uh, you know, she was- It was herself when she was alive, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, hmm. so, so uh, yeah, they, they know it was her. Then she got commissions. Yeah, yeah. but so, then she disappeared, so yeah. to speak. Right. Huh. And then how did they decide that she was who she was later? Well, like comparing paintings? I think um, the late 19th century, they, they're just, um, I think art, uh, the, um, the whole, I think, that, I think there was an advance in being able to identify okay. uh, painters and, and to study their te technique and that, you know, mm -hmm. uh, by that time, by the late 19th century. So they began, I think they realized that this was not, this was, and also they, they probably researched, uh, her name must have been somewhere. Right. You know, Right. Uh, as, as an artist, yeah. So, but before that, no one had the interest to do it, or, 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 and also, I think the very fact that it happened at the towards the end of the nineteenth century was that uh, there was a loosening up of uh, uh, rigid attitudes about women and what they're capable of accomplishing. So that right. went hand in hand with that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. that's oh, a woman can paint. Wow, let's go back <laughs> and find a few others, or they can do this or that. But it took yeah. that long, yeah. But but be, before then, it was um, only oh wow. yeah. All right, so let's watch this uh, documentary. Hope, I don't know if it'll make it to the very end, but we can pick up on it next time. Uh, about the another, we watched one of uh, his um, <clears throat> uh, documentaries about the Baroque period. Here's another one. and easy to repair. No. All right, sit back and enjoy it. I'm up here, this way, over here. I'm up on the colonnade of St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome, high above the crowd, looking down on all these Catholics. Not many people are allowed up here. You know what the Vatican's like. It's been ruling the Catholics for 2,000 years, so there's no need to be nice to me. But I told them what I wanted to do up here, and they agreed immediately because they could see as well that this is the best place to do what I wanted to do, which is to understand properly, at last, that great, sprawling, ungainly, but glorious art movement, the Baroque. age doesn't have a nice clear outline. It sprawled across the 17th century and beyond. It wasn't a tidy movement, but it spawned some of our greatest art. Architect of its astounding square, Gian Lorenzo Bernini, was one of the key players of the Baroque. Understand Bernini, and you understand the whole thing. And what he invented here in this piazza was this huge colonnade that encircles you. 
gathers you up. It's like a giant pair of arms. Now, 300,000 people could fit in here. That's three times more than Wembley Stadium. And every single one of them gets this big hug from Bernini's Piazza. So that's the first thing the Baroque does. It goes after you and ingratiates itself with you. Other art movements sit there on their pedestals and arrogantly assume you'll be interested in them. But the Baroque knows you better. It gets off the pedestal and hunts you down. Another of its ambitions is to impress you with its bigness, its grandeur, its drama. Would you look at the size of that? And when it fell into the hands of intense geniuses, it became dark and edgy, got all psychological on us, and blurred the divide between art and reality. And when painting wasn't enough, the Baroque roped in all the other arts to work on you as well. Architecture, sculpture, music, everything at once. It was after you, so it threw the kitchen sink at you. What we're going to do in this series is follow the Baroque from St. Peter's to St. Paul's, from Rome, where it all began, to London, where it fetched up eventually. Because another of the things that makes the Baroque special is its range. It went everywhere and basically spent the entire 17th century travelling about. And the really cunning thing about it is that wherever it went, it adopted the local customs and changed. And the first place we're going to visit is up here in northern Italy. Trento. Trento in the Italian Dolomites is a pretty town which I recommend for walking holidays and mountain views. But don't let its modern tranquility fool you, because a great war started up here, a war of art. The Baroque is best understood as a fight back, a marvelous display of counter-punching by a waspish church that had come out fighting. When Martin Luther nailed his 95 Thesis onto the church door in Wittenberg in 1517 and launched the Protestant revolt against what he called the sink of Roman sodomy, the popes, the cardinals, he wasn't just taking on the Catholic Church. Luther was taking on the whole of Italy, the entire southern Mediterranean worldview and all that goes with it. The colours, the fruitiness, the passions. In those days, Trento was in Austria, not in Italy. And it was here that the mighty Council of Trent met in 1545 to plot the fight back. A wild boar has invaded the vineyard, complained Pope Leo X memorably. The Baroque's task was to hunt that boar down and dispatch it.
For nearly 20 years, the Council of Trent met here in the cathedral in Trento to plan the Catholic riposte. And art was involved from the start. The Lutherans had been against art. They saw it as a regrettable vanity that led to the worship of false idols. Terrible waves of iconoclasm had torn across northern Europe, destroying paintings, burning statues. But the Catholic Church had always believed in art. It relied on it. It knew that people like to see what they're worshipping. They like images. And that gave art tremendous power. Great profit is derived from all sacred images, declared the council. And when we kiss the sacred image and prostrate ourselves before it, we adore Christ. If anyone shall teach contrary to these decrees, concluded the council scarily, let him be anathema, anathema, anathema. Do you like the map? Baroque, of course. It was produced in Amsterdam in 1617 by Willem Blau, the finest and busiest of the Baroque map makers. Blau would later be employed by the East India Company to chart the new world that was being discovered at this time. But first, he drew Europe. See, the big capitals of Europe at the top. London, Paris, Amsterdam. And down the sides, what people were wearing in these fashionable new capitals. Look, there are the English in their silks. And over here, those Baroque heroes, the Poles with the feathers in their hats. So the Baroque fight back began up here in Trento, but its epicenter, the place where the fireworks really went off, was down south in Rome. The Eternal City had a fight on its hands. As the clock ticked over from the 16th century to the 17th, its architecture grew prouder, louder, showier, and bulged up through the Roman skyline. But, as I said, the Baroque went after you with all the arts at once. And while architecture and sculpture were frolicking in the Roman sunshine, the art form that needed the most drastic attention, painting, chose another path. The Council of Trent instructed its artists to get out there and grab people's attention. But how do you do that? One very effective trick is to make dramatic use of the dark and turn painting into theatre. That was the strategy of the Baroque's greatest revolutionary, a pictorial genius who made damn sure that the religious message of the Counter-Reformation came after you like a spotlit Rottweiler. This master of dramatic darkness was, of course, Michelangelo Merisi da Caravaggio, who deserves our sympathy as well as our admiration. Poor Caravaggio. For 300 years, he was completely forgotten, his reputation in tatters. And then the 20th century rediscovered him and began misunderstanding him in such terrible ways. What rubbish has been spouted about Caravaggio? 
even sensible commentators on sensible TV channels have insisted on seeing him as a knife-mad, predatory homosexual who went berserk in Baroque Rome. The Ripper of Roma. This demonic image of Caravaggio annoys me like nothing else in the Baroque world. As if a sex-mad, out-of-control Roman crazy could really have painted this. Thank heavens, recent research into Caravaggio has begun correcting all this nonsense, and we can start seeing him again for what he really was, the most important religious painter of the Counter-Reformation. Caravaggio did everything the Council of Trent demanded of its artists. He created a vivid new religious art that spoke to the people in a language they could effortlessly understand, a language that moved them and changed them. Before Caravaggio came along, religious art was set somewhere out there, somewhere distant and fluffy, but he made sure it took place right under your nose. Here, now, close enough to touch. The cast list changed too. Real people rounded up in taverns and markets and chosen for their characterful faces, replaced the impossible gods of old. There's that old bloke from the market, and that beautiful waitress from the tavern. These are people you recognize from the streets, people you can touch and whose plight touches you. It's as if Caravaggio has set himself the task of completely reinventing religious art. And he uses every Baroque trick in the book to get your attention. The way this basket of fruit is about to fall over, so you want to reach in and push it back. Or the apostle's hands shoved out into your face. It's all so real, so tangible, so believable. The churches of Baroque Rome are filled with magnificent free helpings of Caravaggio. Just go in, pretend you're praying, and feel his power. Here in the church of Santa Maria del Popolo, where he began working in 1600, he pushes a horse's backside into your face, so uncouthly, and ensures you will not miss the dramatic calling of Saint Paul taking place at the horse's feet. On the other wall, Saint Peter is being crucified upside down. Did you ever see such sweaty effort, such tugging, such pulling, such pain? Look how different it all was from the usual way of spreading the religious message. Caravaggio's art was so tangible, so vivid, so cinematic, that the Roman clergy, which was used to an altogether rosier religious palette, found him a challenge. Some of his greatest paintings were rejected by the churches that had commissioned them. This one here was originally going to hang in St. Peter's, Jesus and Mary stamping on the snake of sin. Was he a little too human for them? Was she a little too sexy? Even his great death of the Virgin was rejected by the monks. Mary, they spat, looked like a bloated whore who'd been pulled out of a river. But I don't think she does. She just looks like a real woman. And in my book, Caravaggio was the best painter of convincing Marys the world of art has seen. Are they too beautiful for their own good? Maybe. Do I mind that? Not at all.
While the clergy complained, the public responded and understood. Caravaggio's lesson, his darkness, his drama, seeped out of Rome and infiltrated the international Baroque at an astonishing speed. And wherever it fetched up, in Spain, in Flanders, in Holland, it transformed the local art. It's a strange name for an art movement, don't you think? Baroque. What does it mean? Where does it come from? If you think of the Renaissance, that's a very clear idea. Renaissance is French for rebirth, the rebirth of civilization. But Baroque? It actually comes from a Portuguese word, Barocco, which means a misshapen pearl, like this one. All these Portuguese explorers were setting off around the world and they were coming back with gorgeous pearls in all shapes and sizes. Now this pearl is not Baroque. This is like the Renaissance, perfectly formed, exquisite, delicate, so civilized and precious. This one, however, the Baroque pearl, is blobby, exuberant, misshapen, difficult to handle, <laughs> and exciting in a deformed kind of way. So this is the Renaissance, this is the Baroque. was this Barocco outline more obvious than in the bendy direction now taken by architecture. Rome is basically a Baroque creation. I know it's got the great ancient ruins and the fine Renaissance palaces, but the default architecture here, the stuff that gives the city its main mood, is Baroque. This beautiful little Baroque secret is a courtyard designed in the 1630s by a genius of the Roman Baroque called Borromini. Francesco Borromini. Borromini, in my opinion, was the single most exciting architect there's ever been. A genius, a man of twisted brilliance. The Picasso of architecture. This tiny courtyard he designed for the church of San Carlo in Rome is almost gothic in its brooding intensity. I don't know if you can feel it in the film, but in the flesh you can certainly sense the solemnity, the sparse profundity of this tiny little space. And remember, architecture speaks to the body, not just the eyes. Borromini was so inventive. Can you see the balustrade up there? Look at the actual balusters, the way some of them bulge at the top and others bulge at the bottom. What for? The Renaissance would never have done something as wayward and playful as that. But Borromini was a rule breaker by instinct, and that makes him totally Baroque. So, this is the cloister 
around which the monks would walk and read their Bibles. Now look at the church. It's like walking into a stony piece of sculpture. I've been in here scores of times. I never miss it if I'm in Rome. And I've stared and stared at this remarkable interior. But if you asked me to draw what's happening to the walls in here, I couldn't do it. It's too complicated, too fidgety, too inventive. But what I can do is to try and draw a plan of the building because it's completely crazy. What Borromini is trying to do here is to blend two completely different shapes. Out here, there's a kind of blunt Greek cross. So a Greek cross with the ends taken off. But in the middle, all that becomes a perfect oval. So this is the edge of the church, all this seemingly chaotic going in and out. But underlying it, as you can see, is this perfect bit of geometry made up of rectangles made up of triangles and these circles here. And that's what Borromini always does. He builds this exact mathematical basis and then he just ruffles it up like someone messing up your hair. I've seen geometry as madly busy as that on the great domes of Islam, but never in a Christian church. Borromini supplied Baroque architecture with something dark and emotional. It's feminine principle, it's yin. But every yin, of course, needs a yang. And in Baroque Rome, the undisputed king of yang was Gian Lorenzo Bernini. The great Bernini was everything that Borromini wasn't. Handsome, rich, haughty, a smooth operator who charmed the kings and the popes. As architect, as sculptor, as painter, the man could do everything. And the raw spirit of the Baroque coursed through his veins as fiercely as the water spouting from one of his fountains. Where Borromini was almost certainly homosexual. And he died this terrible death. He committed suicide, threw himself on his sword, and took a long time to die. Bernini was a ladies' man, through and through. And Bernini would never have dreamt of killing himself, because that would have deprived the world of his flamboyant genius. San Andrea al Quirinale by Bernini. It's just a couple of hundred feet up the road from Borromini's San Carlo, but it seems to come from a different architectural planet. Borromini invented the curved church facade that bends the front of the church out into the street. But Bernini, he got really good at it too. 
And then out here, another curve going the other way. And that's the Baroque for you. It twists this way and that, always on the move, like a restless dragonfly. Walking into Bernini San Andrea is like walking into a piece of theatre. Bernini fills his church with rich colour. Look at that lantern up there, that golden lantern. You put yellow glass up there, so when the sun shines, it's as if the whole interior is being flooded with this gorgeous, golden, divine light. church has this very specific storyline for you to notice and follow. So St. Andrew, the patron of the church, is being martyred here. He's heading up towards heaven there. And right at the very top, in the lantern, he's being welcomed into heaven. The little cherubs are even standing aside to make room for him so he can go up there. It's a very theatrical effect, very different from anything Borromini ever tried to do. The Baroque had a taste for theatricality. That's why it liked Bernini so much. And if you want to witness some truly stupendous Baroque theatre, then follow me into St. Peter's. extraordinary creation in front of us is Bernini's Baldacchino, put up under the transept between 1624 and 1633. Now you have a good look at it, you tell me. Is that sculpture or is it architecture? Or is it a combination of the two, so it doesn't really matter? I go for the last option. That's what you get with a Baroque. All the dividing lines get blurred. Santa Maria della Vittoria, which many people consider to be Bernini's masterpiece, including Bernini. It shows the Spanish saint, Saint Teresa of Avila, at a moment when she's having a vision. An angel has come down to her from heaven and he's piercing her heart with a flaming arrow. So real was the pain to me that I moaned out loud several times. And yet, it was so indescribably sweet that I could not wish to be released from it. When the angel withdrew his spear, I was left with a great love of God. What he's done here is create theatre in the church. On either side, in, sitting in these boxes, is the family that commissioned the Cornaro Chapel, the Cornaro family. Up there on the right, with the little beard, looks a little bit like Shakespeare. That's Federico Cornaro. He's the one who actually paid for it all. So the Cornaro family has gathered to witness this miraculous event at the centre. The other thing that people always pick up on about this work is this look on St. Teresa's face, this open-mouthed, 
moaning look. Now, what Bernini is trying to do here is to find some sculptural form for this religious ecstasy that she's feeling. But the 20th century in particular has misinterpreted that look on her face. All sorts of smutty remarks have been made about her ecstasy. What kind of ecstasy is it? Wink, wink. I really disagree with all of that. Imagine trying to find a sculptural form for something as difficult as a young woman being overpowered by the love of God. How do you convey that? What do you show? Well, I'll tell you the answer. That's what you do. This is art dazzling you with miracles. In Bernini's hands, stone comes alive and stops behaving like stone. He could turn rock into flesh, women into trees. His work is filled with movement and restless transformation. The Cornaro Chapel is a fusion of sculpture, painting, marbling, gilding. Even the real light of God has been roped into achieving this great Baroque effect. If you're investigating the Baroque, this is a position I recommend, because from here, you can see the Baroque properly. The Baroque loved painted ceilings, filling the air above you and around you with remarkable sights was a very Baroque ambition. Of course, painted ceilings had existed in Italian art for centuries. The Sistine Chapel was just the best known example. But they're difficult to do. The Baroque, however, was never afraid of effort. Whatever it took, whatever it cost, the Baroque was up for it. And it developed such a fierce appetite for the painted ceiling. When the art is all around you and above you, it creates this other world into which you've stepped, a new reality. Think of it, perhaps, as a kind of 17th century virtual reality, because these painted ceilings blur the divide between the art and you. This is the first great painted room of the Baroque age. These days, it's the French Embassy in Rome, and they've kindly let us in, because the French are such fine people. But back in the Baroque age, this fine palace belonged to Cardinal Eduardo Farnese, one of the most powerful clerics in Rome. And in 1597, at the very dawn of the Baroque era, Farnese commissioned a young painter from Bologna, Anibale Caracci, to come to Rome with his brothers, who are also artists, and to paint this. Cardinal Eduardo Farnese should have been a man of God, and perhaps in his public life he was. But in his private life, back here in his palace, he seems to have unleashed his sinful side. And what he commissioned Anibale Caracci to paint in the Piano Nobile of the Farnese Palace is a room filled with stories about the mad love affairs of the gods. Wherever you turn in here, pagan gods are loving other gods in a divine orgy of love and conflict and role-playing. 
and naughtiness. Karachi has somehow managed to celebrate 20 different divine love affairs simultaneously on this one ceiling. And to do that, he's employed a cunning optical trick. Each of the love affairs is taking place inside its own picture. And all these pictures have been crammed onto the roof where they're held wonkily in place by a busy assortment of cupids and nudes and statues. And then it gets even more complicated because all these cherubs refuse to stay outside the action. So they get involved. Sometimes they're inside the picture, other times they're outside the picture. Time and space are being played with by a master scenographer. They're being pulled out of the true in this glorious jumble of realities. This room was to be hugely influential and what the Karachi invented here was to become one of the main ingredients of the Baroque. We dart about in this series, going here and there, with me telling you this and that, trying to grasp the Baroque. But to be honest, there's a much easier way. All you have to do to understand the Baroque fully and perfectly is to come in here and look up at that. That is the Baroque. We're in the Jesuit church of San Ignacio. It was built to celebrate the canonization of Ignatius Loyola, the founder of the Jesuits. That's him up there on the cloud. In 1626, Pope Gregory XV officially made Ignatius a saint. And all this could begin. Jesuits liked to keep things in-house, kept down the costs and ensured that the opinions being expressed by the artist were Jesuit opinions. So for this church, they got in a Jesuit lay brother from Trento, Padre Pozzo. Pozzo was a master of illusion. He was the best there's ever been at making small spaces look huge. His influential book on achieving these amazing optical illusions was read by everybody through the ages. They even say that Cecil B. DeMille consulted it when planning his biggest cinema moments. Because Padre Pozzo was a wonderful movie maker, born 300 years early. Pozzo's first work in here was this dark illusionistic dome, which, unlike a real dome, was cheap and easy to repair. You just got someone in and repainted it. The little dome was so convincing the Jesuits decided to unleash Pozzo on the rest of the church. All that is basically a flat roof. The entire sky has been painted. Every cloud, every architrave, every column. What Pozzo's done here is to use his Baroque magic to open up the roof and create this stupendous shortcut to heaven. 
And right in the middle, floating up on a cloud, is Saint Ignatius himself. He's going up to heaven, where Jesus is waiting to greet him. And see that glorious light emanating from the wound in Jesus' side? That's the light of divine revelation, pouring out of Jesus and into Saint Ignatius. And then it's being scattered further to the four corners of the earth. To Asia with that rather wonky camel. To Africa with what I suppose must be a crocodile. Europe, rather tame in comparison, and America. Where a bare-chested, red Indian Amazon looks down at a roaring cougar. All these were places that the Jesuits had their missions. It's what my daughter might call a rather cheesy bit of Jesuit propaganda. But what fantastic theatre, what ambition, what scale, what excitement. something in here I want to show you. It's a little Baroque gem, a secret. It's more work by Padre Polzer. So it's a kind of illusionistic colonnade, all painted by Pozzo, showing the story of the life of St. Ignatius, because we're in the Jesuit college deep inside somewhere. I'm not sure exactly which bit of it. Now what's amazing about this is that you can get really close to the Pozzo painting and see how it's done. For example, can you see the two figures over there holding up an urn on the left? Right, I'll go and point it out to you. Stay there, stay there. These two figures here. Come over here. Look at that. That's how wide they have to be. So all of these figures, all the architecture, has been corrected so that it only looks right from one place. Like all of Pozzo's work, you have to stand on a particular spot for it to look good. Someone asked Pozzo about that once, and they said, What's the point of doing one of these things when you can only see it from one place? That means only one person at a time can see it properly. And he said, ah, that's their problem. My job is to paint it. Their job is to understand it. So here in Rome, a revolution had been launched. Painting had been reinvented. Sculpture transformed. Architecture revolutionized. And it was time for the Baroque to spread its wings. Soon enough, it would arrive on the doorstep of most of the known world and become the first truly global art movement. But first, there was the rest of Italy to conquer. Down here in Naples, for instance, all sorts of Baroque darkness. Fantastic. Yeah, it was a fabulous session, Joe. Stop recording.